Well, this is week one of a three-part series for the next couple of weeks we're going to be in called At the Movies. You'll definitely want to come back uh, for this series. But basically, we're taking some popular movies, some clips from some popular movies, and talking about spiritual applications that can be drawn from them. And the movie that we're using this weekend that we've been giving you hints about for the last couple of weeks is a movie called Blindside. Any, fa any fans? Great movie, great movie. If you haven't seen it, you need to, but our very own Texas Tech's very own Tommy Tuberville was in the movie. We had the opportunity to sit down with him and interview him about it. So I wanna show you that, and then we're gonna go straight into the first scene, and basically our format will be, we'll show a scene, we'll talk about it some, show another scene, talk about it some more. So here's Tommy. It was just a movie of, about a book that nobody thought maybe, you know, some people will watch it, and it's ended up being the largest grossing sports movie of all time. But I was very intrigued how they shot the movie, how they filmed it. Uh, the family, the actual family was on set most of the day. Uh, Sean and uh, Tui and his wife. Uh, and so it, I think it reached a lot of people, not just uh, uh, in the book, but also on the set of how things happen and how it worked. You know, the, this, this is a true story. And uh, I, was a, I played myself it, it, that was written in the book because college coach at Auburn University, I recruited Michael Orr, and so did six or seven or eight other coaches in the Southeast. And it's a great story about a young man that's, uh, that's given an opportunity to build a relationship with a family that's not his family. And they give him help in, in many areas. Uh, and they helped him through tough times and, and pretty much took him under their wing and, and made him a better person. And so, you know, through this movie, I think it's touched a lot of people because of that, because of being unselfish. And uh, as we said earlier, you know, the thing about, I think that uh, God put us on this earth for was to help other people. First point of application, I think we can get out of this movie. You can write this down if you'd like on the back of your program is this. We all go through situations in life that seem hopeless. We all go through situations in life that seem hopeless. Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus said, here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows. Notice Jesus, Jesus didn't say, here on earth you might have some trials and sorrows. Jesus said, here on earth you what? You will have many trials and sorrows. Like here on this jacked up earth that's corrupted by sin, we're gonna have some trials and sorrows. If you haven't had any yet, just know they're coming our way. That's, it's just, it's a part of life. James chapter one, verse two, he's, James is a half brother of Jesus. He said this, he said, when troubles come your way. Notice he didn't say, if troubles come your way. James said what? When, when troubles come your way. Like we all go through situations in life that seem hopeless. Michael obviously was, right? I mean, he's an orphan doesn't have a place to live, he's homeless, his mom is on drugs, his dad is dead. Don't you think he probably thought his situation in life was hopeless? I think so, and yet we go through hopeless situations as well. Maybe for you, it was when your spouse left you. Felt like it, maybe you felt like it was just a hopeless situation. Maybe it was when a parent abandoned you. Maybe it's when you struggled with an addiction. Maybe it was when you were struggling financially or you lost your job. Maybe it's when a loved one, you watched a loved one suffer through a terrible illness or watched a loved one, loved one pass away. It just seemed like a hopeless situation, like we all go through those. Maybe spiritually speaking, it was when you realized that if you got what you deserved one day, it wouldn't be heaven. Like if you haven't realized that, you, you need to. The Bible speaks clearly about this. And when I realized this a number of years ago, man, it concerned me. If I got what I deserve one day, it wouldn't, wouldn't be heaven. The Bible says this clearly in Romans chapter six. If you got a Bible, you can turn with me there. That's where we'll turn. We'll look at a couple verses, but we'll come back to Romans six again. Romans six, verse 23. If you don't have a Bible, or if it's not in a translation you understand very well, we'd love to give you one of these blue ones. We've got some on the benches on the way out. You're welcome to have one of these. It's a New Testament, easy to understand translation. I tell you this, if you read the Bible, you apply it to your life, it can change your life. How many of you guys know that to be true? It, it can change your life. We want you to have one of these if you don't have one already. Page 175, Romans 6, 23, Paul says this. He says, for the wages of sin is what? Death. The wages 
of sin is death. Like the punishment for breaking God's law, like that's sinning, all right? Punishment for breaking God's law is death. It's not necessarily death like we think about it, just like physical death. The Greek word there, which by the way, the New Testament was originally written in Greek. The Greek word there is the word thanatos. Wages of sin is thanatos. Thanatos is referring to eternal death. It's referring to final condemnation. It's referring to a place the Bible calls hell. See, just as a good judge punishes those that break the law and he has a prison to send them to, so also a good God, according to the Bible, punishes those that break his law, that break God's law, and he has a prison to send them to. Now, some people argue and they say, well, here's, here's what I think, Pastor. I think if God is good, he just let everybody into heaven. If God's good, he just let everybody and everybody just get straight. And that's kind of like saying, hey, if a, if a judge in a court of law in our town is a good judge, he just let every criminal that comes through his court of law go free. That's the same reasoning. He just, a good judge is a judge that just lets every criminal go free. We know, we know that that's not true. So here's the problem. Here's the problem. If what Paul is saying is true, which I believe is true, it's the word of God. If, if, if that's true, we got a problem because I don't know if you're like me, but I've broken the law like more than once, like more than 73,000 times. Like I, I, I've, I've broken God's law. I've lied before. I've lusted. I've loved things more than I've loved God. And I just realized a point in time in my life that if I got what I deserved one day, it wasn't going to be heaven. I mean, who was I kidding? It wasn't going to be heaven. It was going to be Thanatos and that really concerned me and I hope that concerns you as well. Now some people argue and they say, well here's the thing, I haven't broken the law very many times. Like I haven't. God's law, I have not broken it very many times. Like I'm, pr I'm a pretty good person. Like if you got to know me, you think I'm a pretty good person. Well in terms of you being reconciled to God, that doesn't matter. Because here's what James says. James chapter 2 verse 10, half brother of Jesus again says this. And this just bothered me when I understood this for the first time. But he says, for the person who keeps all of the laws except one, like that person would be really good, right? They've only broken one of God's laws, all right? The person who keeps all the law, like the really, really good person, is as guilty as a person who has broken all of God's laws. Why is that? Because even if I'm better than the next guy, even if you're better than the next guy, I'm still guilty, right? Like even if you're a really good person, even if I'm a really good person, like I'm, I'm still guilty, and because God's a good God, he's going to demand that a fine be paid. So either I'm going to have to pay the fine. I don't want to. It's Thanatos. Or I'm going to have to find somebody to pay it for me. But because he's good, because he's a good judge, he's going to demand that a fine be paid. So whether we like it or not, whether it feels good to us or not, if we get what we deserve one day, it, it, it's, it's not heaven. And so I think our society needs to quit arguing that if they get what they deserve, it's going to be heaven. Because if that were true, in my opinion, God would not be good. So what we find ourselves in, all of us, all of humanity, is a spiritually hopeless situation. We go through times in life. We go through situations in life that seem hopeless, but there's some really, really good news that we're going to get to in just a minute. Point number two, and this is the good news of Easter, is that Jesus can bring hope into hopeless situations. Jesus can bring hope into hopeless situations. To continue what he was saying from earlier, he said, here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but you can take heart, Jesus says, because I have overcome the world. Like you may go through difficult times in this life like all of us will, but you can take heart and know that I'm in, I'm in control and I can handle whatever comes your way. Like I bring hope, Jesus is saying, into hopeless situations. To continue what James was saying from earlier. James said, when troubles come your way, he said, consider it an opportunity for great joy. And you and I ask, James, how can we consider it like an opportunity for joy when we're getting attacked? Like when, like when things are going horrible in our lives. I think he'd say because Jesus brings hope into hopeless situations. He'll be with us and he'll strengthen us to be able to handle whatever it is that comes our way. So Jesus, through the Tui family, brings hope into Michael's situation, and he wants to do the same for us. So I just say, you know, if your spouse left you, Jesus wants to bring hope into your situation by assuring you that he will never leave you. If a parent abandoned you, Jesus wants to bring hope into your life by assuring you that he'll never abandon you. He'll be a parent to you if you don't have one. If you've lost your job or you're struggling financially, Jesus came to bring hope. He can give us hope by assuring us that he'll provide for us, help us find a job 10 times better than the one we had before. 
If we've lost a loved one, Jesus came to bring hope by assuring us he loved them more than we ever could. And he's ultimately in control. If you struggled with an addiction, Jesus came to bring hope by assuring you that he can help you overcome the addiction. And if you realize that if you got what you deserved one day, it wouldn't be heaven. Jesus came 2,000 years ago to bring a tremendous amount of hope by dying a criminal's death on a cross for us, by rising from the dead on the third day, and then by offering to forgive us of our sins. Check this out. Forgive us of our sins, past, present, and future, and to credit his perfect life to our account, and then to adopt us into his family with the intention of blessing us beyond belief. Like Jesus brings hope into hopeless situations. To finish what Paul was saying earlier in Romans 6.23, he said, for the wages of sin is death, but, like thank God for buts with one T. But yeah, I mean, so uh, wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God, he says, is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So if we get what we deserve one day, it's thanatos, it's eternal death. But Jesus came, Jesus came that we might have eternal life. Check this out, check this, don't miss this, don't miss this. As a free gift. As a free gift. Not something you earn, you work hard enough to attain. It, according to the Bible, it's a gift. So newsflash, like newsflash, and tell everybody you know this. Good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people do. It's not about being good enough, like you're good at weighing your bad. Man, that's an exhausting way to live. You never know if you've been good enough. Not, not about good people going. It's not what the Bible says. It's about people that have been forgiven, people that have received this free gift of forgiveness. You say, well, why don't good people go? Because they've still broken the law, and there's a fine to pay. And because God's a good God, he's going to demand that the fine be paid. Paul says this, I, I, this text, I'm telling you, I read this, it about changed my life. Paul says in 1 Timothy 1.15, this is his story. He said, this is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Watch. Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners. Like, he came to bring hope. And I am the worst of them all, Paul says. You ever felt like that before? But God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners. So it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what your past looks like. I promise you, Paul was worse. And God was patient with him. And he's been patient with you too. He goes on to say, then others will realize that they too, here's the greatest news in all of history, that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life not be good enough or try good out ways of bad and they get eternal life. It's about a decision you make, not something you do. It's about receiving a gift. Those that believe in him can have eternal life. So if you're wondering, hey, how do I have eternal life? How do I know for sure my sins are forgiven? Past, present, future. How can I be sure, 100% sure I die today, I'm going to heaven? How can, how can I be sure? Paul's saying it's about believing in him. And to believe in him is to commit your life to him. To turn from the sin that has led you into your spiritually hopeless situation to turn from that junk that didn't get you anywhere to begin with and to turn to Jesus and say, Jesus, would you bring hope into my hopeless situation? I realize if I get what I deserve one day, it isn't heaven. I need you to bring hope. Bring hope. I commit my life to you. I receive eternal life, forgiveness of sin from you as a gift. I'm not going to try to work for it anymore, try to be a better person. Being a good person is fine. But if you try to be a good person to gain acceptance with God, it's not going to work. Jesus, I commit my life to you. When you make that decision to turn from your sin and ask him to bring hope into your hopeless situation, it changes your life. It does. It changes your life. It doesn't make you perfect, but it makes you different. No question about it. When you sincerely, genuinely commit your life to him. And I talk to people all the time here that come, say this, hey, you know, I kind of thought I made that decision as a child or I got baptized or whatever, but who am I, who am I kidding? I mean, my life changed. Yeah, right sincerely committing my life to Christ, beginning relationship with God. Yeah, right. And they'll tell me, I want to sincerely make that decision today. Thought I'd made it before. I, probably not. Sincerely today, I'm committing my life to Christ. A friend of mine, Parker, was willing to share his story, similar story to this, that he thought he had made that decision, but then came to realize he hadn't. And I wanted him to share his story via video, so take a look. Oh, before I committed my life to Christ, I, I felt like I was always missing something, you know, in everything I did. Every journey I took, every goal that I had, there was always something missing, you know, that I never, I never felt completely satisfied. You know, I was always, you know, looking for love. I was looking for a purpose. I was hoping for hope. 
Um, and, you know, I just never could find it. Didn't realize the whole time that I was actually looking for God to give me some sort of a sign. The whole time he was sitting there with arms wide open, just begging me actually. And um, I just never could see it. When I came to church that particular day, um, you know, for some reason I had a strong urge to go. Uh, maybe some people would call it curiosity. I know that's what I originally thought. And the fact that my wife was uh, saying, we just need to go try it. The other thing is I lived right down the street. You can put it however you want. Um, but for some reason, I was not missing church that day. I remember that day saying, you know what, I'm definitely, even though I felt like I'd already done it, today is the day I'm committing my life to Christ. And uh, I'll never forget picking up my daughter after service and she walked out and the first thing that she said was, um, she said that, uh, Dad, Jesus loves us. And uh, that, you know, I knew, I knew for sure that was definitely a God thing. It's like a, a huge weight had been lifted off my shoulders having to feel like that, you know, I had to satisfy everybody. Um, all that stuff completely went away. I felt that peace. So I don't want anybody to get to a certain point in their life that they regret not doing it earlier. You know, don't wait for some sign. I mean, if you're here and you're thinking about that right now, again, that's a God thing. That's a real thing. You're, it's not a coincidence like, oh, you know, well, yeah, that makes, I mean, you're thinking about it. That's, a, that's your sign, you know, so, um, you know, there's no sense in waiting. I mean, today is the day. There's no doubt about it. Moment of truth. Some of you are here today and you've never made this decision to commit your life to Christ. You realize now and it's overwhelming you that if you get what you deserve one day, it's not heaven. And you realize you need a savior. You need somebody to pay your fine. You're eager to have one. Guess what? He's eager to have you. And all he's wanting is that for us to commit our lives to him. What keeps you from making that decision today? Perhaps God has you sitting here right now in this place in a stinky skating rink to hear that he loves you and wants a relationship with you. What's keeping you today from committing your life to him? Because when you do, who could refuse this? When you do, sin's forgiven. Spot prepared for you in heaven. You can know for 100% sure you die tonight. That's where you're going. Adopted into God's family. Blesses you beyond belief. What, ke what keeps you from making that decision today? Like, like Parker did genuinely this time. Not giving him lip service. Not, oh, I believe the facts. about No, committing your life to him. Nothing more important this Easter than making that decision if you haven't. So I want you to bow your heads with me for a second. God has you here right now for a reason. Ask him what that is. Ask him if he's wanting you today to make that decision. And if he is, it's a decision. It's not something you go do from here. Just pray in your heart right now, right where you're at. Jesus, I commit my life to you. Jesus, I'm in a hopeless spiritual situation. And I'm asking you to bring hope into my hopeless situation. I'm receiving that free gift. I'm not trusting myself to get to heaven. I'm trusting in you. Forget this living for myself stuff. It hadn't gotten me anywhere. Trust in you today, Jesus, to save me. I commit my life to you. If that's you in here today, he's putting that on your heart. Just pray that. Just in your heart, that's it. Jesus, I commit my life to you. Jesus, I commit my life to you. God, I thank you for all those that are making that decision right now to know for certain walking out of here that are right with you. Nothing more important than that. God, thank you for the ones that are making it in Jesus' name. Amen. Point three, and then we're done. After Jesus brings hope, in your hopeless situation, he wants to do more in your life than you ever dreamed possible. After he brings hope, he wants to do more in your life than you ever dreamed possible. Remember this, remember this, this, this could change your life if you actually live this out, it changed mine. God's plans for you are better than your plans for you. God's plans for your life are better than your plans for your life. And I don't know about you, but I, I feel like I got some pretty good plans for my life. God's plans are better. Every day we wake up, we got a choice. His plans are ours every single day. If we choose our plans, and I do that sometimes, maybe you do too, what it seems to lead to over and over again is emptiness and unfulfillment. And I see it in people's lives time and time again. But when we choose his plans, it leads to lasting joy, lasting fulfillment, and lasting purpose in life. I see that over and over again too. So just as Jesus brought hope into Michael's 
hopeless situation. Not only did he do that, but then he did more in his life he ever, could ever dream possible. He becomes a star football player in high school, in college, and in the NFL. You think he, he would have thought walking down the street looking to get into the gym for shelter that that was going to happen in his life? Of course he wouldn't have thought that. He wants to do more in your life than you ever dreamed possible too. Do you know that? So whether your spouse left you or you struggle with an addiction or a parent abandoned you or you had a loved one pass away or whatever, not only does Jesus want to bring hope into hopeless situations that you go through, he wants to do more in your life than you ever dreamed possible. He wants to do more in your life than you ever dreamed possible. If you realize if you got what you deserve one day, it wouldn't be heaven. Not only does it want to bring you hope by saving you and rescuing you, but then he wants to do more in your life you ever dreamed possible by using you, you and me, those of us that have committed our life to Christ, to change the world. You see, the best way to change the world is by sharing with other people the good news that changed our lives. That's a sure way to change the world and it has in history. So remember this. Just as Jesus brought hope into Michael's situation and did more in his life than he ever dreamed possible, he wants to do the same for you. He wants to do the same for you. And the ultimate question you have to answer today is this. Will you let him? Will you let him? I hope you will. I hope you will. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you that you came to bring hope. Thank you for bringing hope into my hopeless situation. Thank you for doing more in my life than I've ever dreamed possible. And God, that you want to do that in everybody's life in here. But it begins, Lord, with committing our lives to Christ. God, if there's anybody in here who hasn't checked that box yet, and you're still drawing them, and they're not sure about, God, I pray they'd cross the line of faith today. They'd make that commitment to you. You'd bring hope into their hopeless situation and then do more in their life than they ever dreamed possible. That's where it starts. Jesus, thank you for coming and dying and rising from the dead so that we could have hope. Your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for checking out one of our messages today. If you made a decision to commit your life to Christ, I'd love to know about it. You can email me at chris at experiencelifenow.com. Also, if you're interested in taking a next step, check out our website at experiencelifenow.com and click on Next Steps. Let us know if we can ever serve you in any way, and we look forward to seeing you soon.